everyone. My name is Lucy Earle. Um, I just want to do an audio check before I launch into my introduction. Um, could the people online let me know if their hearing is okay? We've just switched to in not using the microphone when using a, a standalone piece. They don't want to. Yes, hearing you better. Good. So that means that <laughs> I'm good to good to go. So hello everyone and, and welcome. Um, my name is Lucy Earle. I'm the director of the Human Settlements Group at the International Institute for Environment and Development. Um, I also lead the Institute's work on forced displacement uh, in towns and cities. Um, can we have the slide with the. So, unless I want to introduce the people who are joining us today in the room and online to talk about whether or not we can achieve a world without long term refugee camps. Uh, so online we have um, actually I should talk I should just in the order in which we're going to speak. So actually I'll start with with Romola Davis first. Romola Sanya, um, who is professor in the geography and planning department at the London School of Economics. Um, we also have Lauren Landau, who will be speaking after Romola, who is professor of migration and development at the University of Oxford. But also we're missing your creation here with the University of Berkeley's but. In South Africa. Um, and then online, our third speaker today would be Skidda Nagash, who is president and CEO of the US Committee for Refugees and Immigrants and who's joining us from Washington, D.C. So, welcome to all of you. Um, I'm going to start off with a bit of discussion about why we're here um, before opening the floor to our distinguished speaker. So, um, over the has been working in a consortium of organizations on a project entitled uh, Out of Camp or Out of Sight? Question mark. Realigning responses to protracted displacement in an urban world. We did shorten that to protracted displacement in an urban world, or PDUB as we call it. And you're seeing here um, on the screen and behind me um, the website for this project. And it's coming to a close, and we actually just had a day and a half a symposium where we've discussed findings with other scholars in the field of practitioners. And the reason we started off this project was that we felt there was a focus of funding and attention being predominantly given to refugees in camps around the world. That, that was where humanitarian funds were flowing, that's where a lot of academic research was being done. And we wanted to realign the focus because as some of you will know, the majority of refugees around the world are living in towns and cities. Um, the statistics are slightly um, unreliable, but we generally use the say around 60% of refugees are in towns and cities around the world. The majority of those are in um, countries in lower and middle income countries. And then we also talk, um, there's also, it's very hard to know this, but there are also people who are internally displaced, and we believe the majority of those people are also in towns and cities. So people who haven't crossed an international border but are, are, um, have had to leave their, their homes because of a fear of violence, conflict, um, but also increasingly um, climate-related events as well. So our project um, ran for three and, a half, three and a half years, focusing on four countries, so on Jordan, Kenya, Afghanistan, and Ethiopia, and in each country we looked at one camp and one urban area. Um, and we compared the outcomes for refugees in those, in those two areas in each country looking at their well-being and their livelihoods, options and their enterprises. And we did assume from the start that urban areas would be better places for overall well-being for refugees. Um, and that cities, towns and cities, had the potential to give quite more dignified existence. Um, so happily, after all this research and thousands of survey, survey responses and, and interviews, um, that has largely come out to be the case, that it's true that the refugees on a number of different ways of measuring their, their well-being um, do, are doing better in towns and cities, but life in cities is still very, very hard. Um, and in some cases where camps are better funded, the, the difference between being in a city and being in a camp is not as extreme as in other places. And I'm not going to go into the findings here because then I'll be speaking for hours, but we have a website where we are slowly, as we, as we produce our many outputs of this project, that will be uploaded there. So if you're interested in working papers on each of the countries or policy briefs, you'll, you'll find them there. Um, and this project is part of a portfolio of work that we're doing in IID where we're looking at the cost of camps. Um, so the economic cost, which seems to be almost 
uncomfortable. Um, but also the human costs of being in a camp, the idea of some wasted lives, and the opportunity costs, the wasted, the economic potential, and the desire to work among so many people who spoke with over the course of our research who are not able to because of the restrictions on them living in camp. But camps continue to exist, and new camps continue to be built, and they are often the default response to large groups of communities. And we find that those trying to make a life in towns and cities are largely ignored and left without humanitarian assistance if they to their homes. And so we have uh, brought us a paper, this came out uh, last week, um, which if you give on the slide, um, you'll see, you'll see it here. A paper entitled, Why the International Community is Failing Urban Refugees, or Myths About Protracted Displacement. Um, bold, a bold title, it aims to sort of draw people in. And we discussed in this paper the forms that have emerged over the course of our, our research and that we think are sort of maintaining focus away from cities and towards camps. And these myths are the, the idea that refugees in cities, if they're there and they're not receiving humanitarian assistance, they must be doing okay, they must be self-reliant in the terminology of the sector. Uh, we found that actually there's a wide range of outcomes of, of refugees living in cities and some are indeed doing okay, but there are other pockets of real extreme vulnerability. There's also uh, an assumption um, long held that the refugees who go to cities are different from the ones in camps. They're young and they're educated and they tend to be men. We didn't. We actually personally spoke to exactly the same number of men and women across all our research methods. So we can't. We we don't have data on percentages of men versus women that we've produced. But certainly we can say that in the refugee populations that we looked at, there are many people with, with education in the camps who are uh, generally not able to use it, and, and there are also some. Very, um, there are people in cities who have avoided camps, particularly women who may be illiterate, who are extremely poor, where they've chosen not to be in a camp because they, they feel that they can provide a better life for themselves and their families in the city. The myth, third myth is that camps act as safety nets and safe havens. We found that actually in camps, people are going hungry on a regular basis, that uh, there's a problem of homelessness in camps where people are mainly for months or years without being registered without shelter. We assume that camps are providing the basis of life, but actually, in many cases, that isn't happening. And finally, a myth that, that I get quite exercised about, the idea that camps can become standalone towns or cities, autonomous human settlements that can flourish and become just like any other town or city. And this is very problematic because camps are generally sited specifically away from industry, away from major sites, of where other people might be living. They're often in, in extremely hostile terrain, uh, remote often border regions, where even uh, subsistence agriculture could be very it's, it's difficult to, to achieve. So the idea that somehow, with enough investment, these camps can turn into standalone cities, I think is a, is a very tall order. So I'm gonna um, just finish talking about this paper, I say that we are doing it for an in-situ response, so for aid to travel where refugees want to go. Not all refugees want to be in the southern cities, I appreciate that, but many of them do, but the humanitarian community is not following them with aid and assistance. Um, and we're suggesting that they should perhaps, there should be more of a focus on the types of work and enterprise that refugees are trying to do despite extremely restrictive circumstances and supporting them. Then the question arises, if we can move towards supporting refugees outside of camps, can we get to a place where camps no longer exist? Now, I've often been told that this is a uh, utopian ideal, and perhaps it is, but it's a bit of a dream, right? Um, so the idea to, for today's conversation is to, to think about that possible future. Is there a future that we could have a world without long-term refugee camps? Appreciating that in the acute moment of a, of a crisis where people are, large numbers of people are moving from one country to another, they may need to live somewhere temporary. But often camps remain in place for decades. Whole generations of people live up grow up in camps, way beyond what can be considered the emergency phase. So the questions I have for speakers, and you know you can answer your own questions as long as it vaguely fits the theme, but I have got a few here that I'm going to throw out. So what are the political and institutional barriers to a change in approach by the international community and coasting governments? What evidence? could help dissuade decision makers from establishing camps in the first place or keeping them open after the end of the emergency phase. How can we challenge the status quo? What are our advocacy options? 
And is there a way that we can disrupt the current system that incentivizes the building of camps? So with that, I'm going to hand over to Pramila. Um, to take on some or none of those questions. And to help us imagine or not that future without refugee camps. Um, well, thank you, Lucy, uh, for that challenge. And thank you all for being here today and also to everybody who's online. Um, I, I thank you and also for the invitation um, to participate in this. Um, I think it's a bit of a tall order because I've been given 15 minutes uh, ish, right? Um, to talk about, you know, whether we can envision a sort of a, an end to refugee camps. And in particular, I think um, this question around um, political barriers um, to uh, to sort of change and you know the kinds of incentives that are that are created to put up camps. So I, I thought on this challenge, and I thought 15 minutes is, is probably not you know is not a huge amount of time because you could probably write um, several books out of this. Um, but for, I thought perhaps um, I could offer one way of thinking about some of the political barriers. And so before I begin, I wanted to just uh, preface this with the position um, and the background that, that I began this work almost two decades ago, um, which is from, uh, from the perspective of housing and urban poverty which were the things that I was really interested in when I first started this. And I had started actually doing research on something quite different, looking at these questions around housing and urban poverty and found my way into looking at questions of displacement. And the housing question was always quite central to what I was interested in. And so that is the lens that I take um, to thinking about political barriers. And when I first started this work, I was intrigued by precisely the kinds of questions which Lucy has raised, which is, um, and and the, the, the challenges that she has brought to us, which is that we, you know, can we in fact create this world without camps? Can we have aid follow people who are displaced to where they want to go? And the question that I thought of then was, why doesn't that happen? And I came at it from a housing point of view, which led me to this question of citizenship. Um, and working in the Global South, uh, working across two very different uh, regions in the Middle East and South Asia, um, I began to ask questions around what does citizenship mean in many of these places? Um, what does citizenship offer people by, you know, in a particular country by way of rights, privileges, their opportunities to engage with governments, to participate in meaningful ways? What are citizens able to do? Um, you know, what are they? You know, what are they gaining from their membership to a particular polity, or are they even, in fact, aware of the citizenship in a particular country? Um, there, are, you know, in in the, the symposium over the last couple of days, we have um, talked about how um, even within a particular country, different populations of people are governed in quite different ways. And even across regions and countries, we see um, the state operating in quite different ways and people being um, abandoned or ignored um, or treated as second class or third class citizens. So we see this sort of variation in citizenship across different populations and, acro and across different regions as well. Um, and so the question of social, political, economic, and also spatial inequality is central to how we think about these kinds of these questions around citizenship. Um, and of course, like you know, thinking about the global south, which is a sort of vast terrain, very problematically labeled, which also hosts the you know large numbers of refugees, especially in camps. In many of the countries that we look at, these are also countries. Um, that have very specific, have a range of different challenges. So there are countries that have high amounts of debt, for example. Uh, they um, struggle with these questions of legitimacy. Um, they can extend control and power over certain amounts of their territory and not others. 
they face high levels of poverty. Within the global economic system, they are treated in very specific ways. So they are, they are seen as, as sites of extraction. Whether that's resource extraction or labor extraction. And in a world which is highly unequal, many of these countries, which also carry the highest burdens of refugees, are also some of the poorest. They are also racialized in very particular ways within the global system. They're not treated as equals. They're not given a seat at the table as equals. So they are not treated as the partners of so-called global superpowers. And if you think about it, many of them are unable to afford to, to give their citizens what some of us may consider to be, you know, uh, somewhat basic resources like water or sanitation, electricity, roads, so forth. So in many of the countries, uh, when we look at the poor, whether they be urban or rural, they often face very high levels of deprivation, very high levels of destitution as well. So what does that, what does citizenship mean in these countries? And, and you could take some of these questions, you can apply them to the, to the global north as well. So you could look at uh, countries like the one that we're sitting in right now, which is the United Kingdom. Um, um, and here again, we also see very deep-seated um, inequalities, very high levels of poverty. Uh, we see scarcities that are manufactured by governments, whether they are um, around housing or whether they are um, around other issues. There are significant levels of inequality, um, of deprivation um, in the United Kingdom. For those of you, I, I know there are several people here who are joining from other, other places, but in the UK we're facing a cost of living crisis, which then translates into a food crisis, which translates into a housing crisis, energy crisis. Uh, in one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Um, and again, you could ask this kind of question of what does citizenship mean in, in, in this country or, or in similar countries. So you, you could say that, you know, this, what you see in, in a lot of places perhaps is, you know, this kind of question emerging about what does citizenship mean? Um, is there a crisis of legitimacy? There, and you could argue that there's no substantive difference between the conditions of the poor and the non-poor, which includes migrants and refugees. So how do governments create distinctions between the poor um, on the one hand and refugees and asylum seekers on the other, especially as humanitarian crises threaten to unsettle their authority and their legitimacy further? So how do they, con how do they construct very specific ideas of citizenship against the backdrop of um, displacement. Um, now, you know, one of the things that I have heard over and over again in a lot of countries is that, you know, they're not countries of asylum, uh, but at the same time, they don't refoul people, right? So if we know what the law of refoulement is, which is that you don't return, right, to put it very blandly, you don't return people by force to places where they have escaped um, from violence or persecution. So even though you have a lot of countries that do not have laws around refuge, um, they still offer refuge in very particular ways. Like they, they, will, they will sort of provide some, they will look the other way, so to speak. Um, so as I said that, you know, I came to this question from, from housing, from that question of housing to kind of think about, well, how do these distinctions get created between those who are citizens and who are the poor and those who are refugees um, and asylum seekers. And one of the lenses that I came to it through was to this question of housing. So if you look at the idea of refuge, it's not just a legal right. Um, it's not just a question of, um, of about you know, safety per se, but at the, at the fundamental level, the question of refuge is also very much about space. It's a sanctuary space. It is fundamentally a spatial question. Um, so if we think about that question of refuge, it is to provide safe space or shelter from harm, uh, a site of some, some kind of protection. So what we see in, in um, I think, more and more is, is that that kind of shelter then translates in, in quite problematic ways, right? Um, so it comes in the form of asylum accommodation in, in, in this country um, and, you know, refugee camps and so forth. Um, and so you could make the argument that what you, what you, what the sort of uh, division is, is that um, 
you provide those who are coming to you for protection a kind of a right to housing, a, a kind of a right to shelter, not housing, but a kind of a, a right to shelter of sanctuary space, a particular space in which they can they can live in a specific way. But what do they give up in return? They give up the right to work and they give up the right to mobility. On the other hand, you have the poor in, in many countries who are often denied the right to shelter. Um, and we see large scale evictions taking place in countries around the world. We see evictions of informal settlements, um, uh, land grabs, infrastructure projects, all of which drive people off the land. But they are theoretically given the right to work and to move. So for some who may be citizens, uh, you know, the displacement might become, uh, displacement and resettlement might become sort of continuous and lifelong processes as well. So while displacement might be this kind of thread that ties different communities, uh, one of the different, uh, one of the many threads that ties different communities together, kinship might be another one, uh, different sets of rights are set up in opposition to each other to destabilize what should be solidarities between people due to their shared experiences of poverty, deprivation, and abandonment. So asylum seekers are pitted against welfare recipients, for example, here in the UK. Refugees are pitted against the poor in countries in different parts of the world. Uh, migrants, asylum seekers, refugees, however you know, problematic those differentiations are, are scapegoated for scarcities, uh, real or imagined, through this kind of citizenship. Uh, and, uh, and, and through this is, is how we sort of see citizenship and, and statehood manufactured. So for me, I think sort of caps play a really important role in this, in that they become, as you've rightly pointed out, they become sort of, they become prisons for people who are displaced and they become prisons for a very long period of time. Um, and they become these kinds of spaces in which people are warehoused for very long periods of time. And one of the ways in which we can see this is to, is to see how this, this becomes a very visible uh, space to show, to show that differentiation between who is a citizen and who is a non-citizen, to identify that this is in fact the price to pay for protected space. Um, I promised Lucy that I would, I would um, try and come up with a positive spin on this. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's, it's difficult because I'm, I'm a cynic. Uh, most of the time, uh, but since I was asked to reflect on, on how we can achieve a world without Trump, uh, without camps, I'm going to come to this point, then, which, which is a point that I made earlier, which is about the global south, and I and I, I pointed out the unequal table about the ways in which the global south is racialized, is treated as sites of resource extraction, and not as equal partners, not being given that seat at the table and yet asked to carry out the disproportionate burden of displacement. And I would suggest that neither, firstly, communities are not necessarily unwelcoming to refugees or asylum seekers in the first instance, not even in this country, um, contrary to what the government will have you believe. Um, and neither are most governments, want, neither do many governments want to be seen as being hostile either, unless again, unless you're this country, I mean, in which case you push out a hostile environment policy. Uh, more on that later. Um, but they do have concerns over their own well-being, their own scarcities, and their own crises. So I would argue that if we want to have a solution to the problem of camps, that we need to move beyond tweaking humanitarianism. Um, uh, and I, I build on some of the points that were made earlier in the, in the discussions in, over the last two days to, to get to the root causes. But we have to change the system. We have to create a system in which the global south is seen as being equals, as being partners, for those as places that can and, and should in fact have the right to be in charge of their own futures. Um, to be in charge of, you know, their priorities rather than dictating those to them. Um, because just as, to me, it, 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 in a way, it almost sort of cascades down the sense of powerlessness and this, this sense of um, this sort of a punitive system in which um, those countries who are unable 
to have that seat at the table also in turn then cascade that powerlessness down to those who are seeking hospitality from them. So perhaps with a kinder world we can have no caps. But I think this is a utopian project. Title in there. <laughs> Thank you, Roma. So um, we are going to take questions after the, the three speakers have finished. So um, hold on to your thoughts. And we're going to turn now to Laura. All right, thank you, Lucy, and thanks. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. I'm sitting in this easy chair, but I should have a smoking jacket and a pipe. Um, but I'll try not to speak in this sort of late evening tone. Keep it a little short and, and interesting. I think this is a really fascinating question of whether we should have camps or not. And, and I'm taking my response, which I, I think will echo many many of the themes that uh, that has brought up. And, and, and also surfaced in your opening comments. I'm taking a lot of inspiration in addressing this question from colleagues who would consider themselves abolitionist scholars. Scholars often dedicated to abolishing prohibitions on sex work, prohibitions or on prisons particularly. And I think that the comparison with prisons is obviously, is obvious here, right? It is, camps are a place where people live constrained lives. One of their mantras is, we need to stop those things which are killing us or killing people. And while camps are not murder sites, usually, they're not sites of, of extermination, they're not concentration camps in that sense, keeping people in camps for long periods is a way of, of killing them. It kills the possibility of their future. It kills their agency, their chance to, to dictate where they go in life. And it can ultimately be a form of, of kind of cultural destruction or isolation, as we've seen in Cox Bazaar and some of what's happening there. So from them, we, you know, I take that first point. I take two other points from the abolitionists. The first is we don't necessarily have to have a fully thought out alternative before we say we should get rid of something. We know it's bad. We know this is terrible. We know that it's, it's killing people if you buy that argument. So we should be fighting to get rid of it. But the third thing I take from them is that we shouldn't fixate on that object per se. So the people who fight against prisons say, yes, prisons are terrible. But the point is not to just get rid of them or to reform them. It's A, to try to address the systemic issues that lead people into prison, whether that is inequality, whether it's racism, whether it's, it's a, a conflict or targeting of, of specific groups by the police. But it's also looking at what happens afterwards, right? Or what are the, what kind of, uh, of other systems are in place so that if these prisons weren't there, that people would be taken care of in an appropriate way, that we would be able to keep people safe. It's not just about getting rid of them and letting anything happen. And I think that's where we need to address this issue. Right? Have, we, have we moved or thought through what would need to happen before and what would need to happen after? If we start thinking about what would need to happen before so that we wouldn't have people who were displaced. Well, that was the project of the UN in 1945. We haven't got there yet, right? Of, of solving the world's conflict, solving the kind of inequality, people fighting for freedom, fighting for oppression, fighting for whatever it is, self-determination, fighting for domination. That's still there. It's likely, given the way the world is going, crises over environment, crises over uh, inequality, we're going to see more violence in the future. We are seeing rising nationalism. We are seeing ethnic conflicts that have been subdued for years resurfacing. Conflict is not going away, and as long as there's conflict, there will be displacement. As we've seen in the last few years, more displaced people than at any time since World War II. So we're not doing a very good job of addressing those causes of displacement. And are we doing a job of creating other places for people to go? And that's a lot of what your work has been, and it's about going to cities, right? If they're not at camps, they've got to be somewhere if they're displaced, and that will be maybe in rural areas, small towns, large cities. And are we there? Are we at a point where we can say, without camps, these people will be safe? And I think for many of the reasons that Romila just discussed, we're also not there yet. And that's where our work needs to be. 
Right now, where we are is where people don't have rights often when they move to cities. So they enter the realm of the urban poor, who remain, and they are just as marginalized as the urban poor, but without even the benefits often of citizenship, whether it's formal or informal, where their rights to be there are, are recognized. We're also looking at a situation where the abolition of camps, or the, as, as you mentioned, the transformation of camps into cities, is not about protecting people, right? It's about keeping people, uh, uh, it's, it's done in a way that's about extracting resources from the international community and still keeping them effectively in a prison, just a prison that we call something else. So if you take the camps in northern Kenya that they're trying to convert into cities, these are cities that will be in a desert. They are cities that barely supported pastoralists before, but never could imagine, no one could imagine could support half a million people living densely together. Keeping them there, saying that you're giving them housing, but only if they stay there, is basically a form of, it's an alternative form of camps under the name of prisons, right? And this fits the broader language of self-reliance, I think, that we see within the UN or the language of resilience, which is basically shifting the responsibility for care from institutions and states to individuals, right? And without camps under the current situation, that's what will happen. And we see that over and over again with the discussions of urban refugees. They can take care of themselves. So why do we need aid? Anyway, it's really expensive in cities, so we don't have the money. But these people are self-reliant, they're resilient, they can take care of themselves. That may be true in some instances, but that should always be a choice. So are we at a point where we can really imagine a world without camps? Is that the right thing to even be pushing for? And I think it obviously it still is certainly a world without the kind of camps that we have, which are killing people, which keep them in prison effectively for generations sometimes, which are in effect a form of, of genocide for some groups because it is denying them the right to for humanity and it's an assault on their culture and values. But are we able and can we imagine a way in which we can address these other issues? Can we stop conflict? Probably not. But I do think we can think about how do we reform camps internally, and the abolitionists would hate me for saying that there's a way of reforming. But I think the real work to be done before we can abolish camps is precisely the kind of work that many of us have been doing now of thinking through how do we create suitable a politics in which people can be settled elsewhere, can actually be free and live their full lives. Rome has outlined some of the challenges to that, rooted in citizenship, rooted in administration, rooted in resource scarcity. But I think that's really where the fight is. And until we figure it out that, we still actually will probably need camps. Thank you, Karen. You have all, um, you're less cynical than I imagined you might be. <laughs> I can be cynical. <laughs> <laughs> Save that for later. Yeah. So now I'd like to turn to Kundalakesh, who's on, online. I'm hoping that you've been able to hear um, our conversation up until now. Um, so um, the floor is yours, Kinder. Please, um, you can take yourself off mute and, and give us your views on these on this topic. Uh, good, good afternoon. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, you know the connection is not very good, uh, so I missed a lot. But uh, as always, when you become the last speaker, you tend to repeat what other people say. So for me, forgive me for that. Uh, thank you, uh, Lucy, uh, for organizing this this conference. Um, as some of you may not know, the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants. Uh, we are not a government agency. Um, have been. Uh, uh, working on this issue for many, many decades. Uh, in fact, we started our advocacy uh, uh, since 1969. Uh, and then we spent about 15 years talking about refugee warehousing. Uh, we presented uh, the case the, uh, at UNSCR gathering and other international gathering. Uh, we didn't get any traction. In fact, some of them uh, criticize USCRI being strident, talking about refugee warehousing. You know how how could you say refugees are a warehouse? 
I'm very glad to hear uh, that the, the previous presenters actually looked at uh, camps as as a prison, which is it, it's uh, you know an open prison perhaps. Um, so what I wanted to just do is you know since we are talking just repeating about camps, you know who are these people who are living in camps, and we know that you know they they are refugees. But we need to also realize that some of these refugees have been in this camp for since 1968. Um, I mean, if you go to Eastern Sudan, you have, you know, three generations of refugees in a camp, you know, for, you know, um, yeah. And then if you go to the uh, uh, Algeria, you have Sahrawi refugees uh, since 1975. Uh, we have also a camp in Kenya, since we keep talking about Kenya and Dadaab and Kakuma, we have refugees since 1991. So this camp, as, as uh, we talk about it, is not really a camp. It is uh, an open prison uh, with no rights, no right to own a business, no right to go to education, no rights uh, for free movement. So we have to properly define these people who have been, I just give you a few examples of the long-term refugee camps. Uh, and some of them I visited, and some of them actually I lived as a refugee myself. Uh, so the, this, the, the growing refugee number, I mean, as according to UNICEF, is exceeding of over 100 million refugees and IDPs. I mean, this is probably one of the largest country if we, if we decided to put them in, in one, one location. Thank God they are in different location, even though uh, their condition is probably the same. Um, again, you know, unfortunately, given the provocation of global conflict, including terrorism and the upsurge of refugees and, and playing violence, uh, the fundamental human right enshrined in the 1951 Convention relating to the status of refugee as a protected instrument, that includes the right to work, to practice profession, to run business, own property, to move, move about freely, and to choose their place of residence have been willfully and steadily ignored. Although not in the 1951 convention in the last 70 years, the international community, uh, the, the UN agencies have made refugee camp policy a long-term strategy of containment in a country's of first asylum. That this policy of containment has successfully uh, uh, keeping refugees in open prison for several generations with no viable future. However, the new generation of refugees have rejected this inhumane practice and decided to pursue alternative solution by taking long treacherous trails in search of freedom. A refugee camp doesn't have freedom enshrined in it. The host country doesn't provide freedom. So this new generation of refugees decided to pursue where they think there is a possibility of getting uh, a freedom to live or treated as a human being. Once again, the international community response to this influx has been the policy of denying refugees the, the right to live a normal and decent life. Uh, some of them actually, as we speak, are forcibly returning them to first country of asylum, or worse, bartering them with other countries for financial uh, gain. In my opinion, this practice are unlawful, morally indefensible, and I would say, I dare to say it's a crime against humanity. The ongoing and sometimes hostile domestic and international dialogue around national security, fear of nationalism and terrorism have increased the media spotlight on refugees and immigrants as a threat to the national security. But what refugees are doing is they're making self-determination. 
rather than just spending 60 years, 40 years, 30 years in refugee camp, they decided, you know, the current refugee migrant, you know, choosing to leave refugee camps where there are no opportunity to work or get an education. They are living in an urban area now in host countries as well as fleeing to other nations. This is a de facto rejection of the, the, the system that we have been running for over 70 years it, and the policy of containment that put people uh, in, in a very, very uh, difficult uh, situation. Currently, there are many active refugee and immigrant-led organizations addressing the real need of uprooted people. The collective and increasingly organized voice representing untapped and perhaps previously undervalued resource and resettlement field. So, in, in, oops. Uh, so my uh, I, uh, my view on on this very uh, topic is the 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 containment of refugees, whether they are in, in an open uh, refugee camp or uh, an urban setting, is we have failed to come up with a solution. You know, increasingly, you know, NGO government groups and other entities and private nonprofits and sector are becoming multinational organization. The population they represent are becoming more diverse linguistically, ethnically, and racially. The diversity of this, uh, of uh, refugees and IDPs, uh, probably give us a, a, a different perspective that we haven't seen since 1951 or since 19. Uh, 50, where uh, UNHCR was uh, established. Uh, the other challenge we have is categorizing people as either refugees or migrants. It's a simplistic, it's inaccurate, and even harmful. Those identified as refugee, uh, uh, fleeing uh, poverty are not granted the same privilege uh, if there is any privilege of being a, as, as refugees. Uh, you know, once warrant more sympathy than the other, and in some cases, the level of refugees or migrant is used to propel political arguments and deny rights under the convention by, by endorsing refoulement. As we see recently uh, in different countries, mostly in European countries, the idea of refoulement to other third world country uh, is continuing, uh, and we are not really uh, seeing any uh, advocacy when it comes to this practice. Uh, speaking of uh, sympathy, I think the other thing we're struggling as, as a collectively the advocates uh, globally is the, select, the selective outrage of certain refugees has become normal. Some refugees are more refugees than others. As we have seen recently, some genocides are worth talking, taking action, and some are very concerning. So this practice of selective outrage is also harming the global refugee system, and the system is at tipping point. Language can also be misused by well-intended advocates. For, for example, many of the policy were referred to uh, burden sharing. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I don't believe that a human being can be a burden to another human. But rather, I think we should actually refer it as responsibility sharing. If my data is correct, almost 86% of all refugees IDPs are in the global south, poor country, not, not in Europe, not the United States. So, you know, the advocates often fall prey to this tendency to consider refugees and migrants as vulnerable, suffering, defenseless. This reinforces the concept of uprooted people as weak and helpless, overlooking their many assets as, as well as denying their decision-making power. In the United States, you know, people say, you know, this is a country of refugees and immigrants. 
well, if refugees and immigrants are a burden to any society, I, I believe that the United States will be the poorest country in the world. Again, this inherent assumption is more difficult to, to combat. So I believe that the part of the challenge we have is, you know, we stop actually seeing ourselves of the people trying to advocate. Uh, we sometimes make a statement that refugees who have been refugee camps for 68 years somehow are protected. Are protected from what? You know, are they protected for uh, poverty? Are they, you know, uh, or or uh, education? I mean, what are we protecting them for? Of course, you know, when they go to uh, uh, urban slum. Uh, like Italy and other places I, I, I know, including in Ethiopia, uh, that we have you know, a growing number of refugees, very much with no rights. Uh, they are at the mercy of the local police. Uh, whenever they want, they put them in prison. Sometimes you know, uh, they don't have the right to work. So victims of human trafficking, uh, sex trafficking, labor trafficking, so again, you know, the system, this international system that, you know, a lot of scholars have been spending their time researching and writing is missing the human aspect of, of this suffering. We have, we have refugees come hidden from the media because the media doesn't necessarily, uh, you know, see this unless it has some geopolitical impact. You know, we have, uh, you know, Rohingyas, uh, in a refugee camp uh, when the and flooding and people are dying. Uh, we noticed that a couple of refugee camps were burned down because of conflict, and we don't know how many of them are still missing. So I think you need, we need to really give it a humanitarian aspect. Whether, uh, and, and that aspect is has to be based on freedom. Freedom is a key. Do human beings have inherent freedom to live as a human being regardless of their legal status, whether they are immigrants, whether they're IDP, whether they're you know, asylum seekers. Yeah. I think that's a challenge. I don't believe that for the past 70 years that what we practice is can continue. We need to come up with a new dynamic uh, freedom-based approach to migration. You know, you know, otherwise, will continue to come up with very simple solution. You know, okay, you know, let's do this in a camp. You know, by the way, not all camps are the same. Some camps are different because some camps do have resources. Uh, you know, if you go to the camp uh, in Jordan and the camp in Dadaab is not the same, or, or, or in, in Kakuma. Or if you go to the Shemalbar uh, refugee camp, uh, which I visited and did a documentary, you know, it doesn't actually exist. About 25,000 people actually uh, perished and nobody knows. Or the Sudan refugee camp, the new ones, are in a horrible condition. So again, you know, we, we have to really think in terms of a freedom and you know, self-determination approach of refugee resettlement. Uh, the idea that we have no new policy, we, had, we don't even want to have asylum seekers go through the process of making a case for their, their asylum application. As you know, in some places, in fact, refugees are con considered infiltrators, uh, not people who need asylum. So I think the global refugee system, in my view, uh, is a, a historic crossroad. And irrespective of what the media reports, uh, the so-called refugee crisis is a, fu is a fundamental cause of refugee warehousing. We have been warehousing people. Uh, we have no data how many of them second generation, how many of them died, uh, how, how many of them are still living. We have no data to show uh, because their, their condition, uh, as long as we keep them, as long as they are contained so they don't have to go to developing country, it seems to be a, a simple uh, policy decision that have been practiced for many, many years. Um, so again, as I say, you know, uh, being the, the last speaker, I'm sure I'm repeating uh, what the two panelists said, um, but I will uh, end here and hopefully we'll have a robust discussion. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Skinder. That was, that was great. And actually, you said quite a lot of different things um, to the previous, previous speakers. I'm sorry that you weren't able to hear an apologies for 
some of the audio problems that we're having. Um, I guess I feel that, that actually in the room we've got two quite different approaches here. We have Romola saying, what did you tell us? Uh, move beyond tweaking the humanitarian system. And I heard Lauren suggest that we should have a world without the type of camps that we have now, which would suggest some, some tweaking. So <laughs> it's necessary. So in the sort of being we talked about in the last few days about being principled and but also being about being pragmatic. Pragmatically, what could we do differently in the current world that we're living in? And looking at Romola with maybe have planning hats on, or asking Lauren how we might be changed some the incentive structures possibly for that. But I want to um, also give you the opportunity to respond to each other and what you've just heard. Um, can I pass on you, Lauren, first? Oh, all right. Yeah, I, I think right now we're in a situation where camps are, there's an incentive for everyone to have camps. That's how, if you're a, a global south country, it's how you play a, a domestic political game and how you extract resources from the international community. And I think donors can play a huge role in shifting that, right? Not an unwillingness to continue to support camps as they are, and a willingness to invest in systems that might incentivize other forms of settlement. So we've talked a lot over the last few days about how could you invest in urban systems on the condition that refugees live there. And we monitor their conditions so that we make sure that they're not heading into a, a sort of ghetto-like existence that they'll never escape from. So I think those are, are things that you can do, and some of those can be done without a big political fanfare. They can be done through development aid. We don't have to have a campaign about ending camps or about you know, integrating refugees into host societies, which will have a political backlash. You can do this by simply shifting donor funding, moving some of the money out of an extraordinarily expensive and wasteful humanitarian system into systems where we're mainstreaming. We're doing urban planning in a place like Ethiopia, or in, a, you know, in many other countries, urban planning means planning for displacement and migration. That's what you need to see. And then you have cities that are perhaps better able to absorb. Then it becomes more ethical to say, let's close the camps because these people will have other places to go to. I think some of those kind of practical shifts can happen. Obviously, very granular work in each city, understanding the politics, understanding what's possible there. But I think at the donor side, since it is donors that are effectively driving encampment, shifting aid policy, humanitarian policy, global humanitarian policy, trying to uh, uh, not attack, but to address the UNHCR, who also likes camps because it keeps them in charge, right? And trying to shift some of the ways in which they are assessed and funded could really change some of the, the benefits that currently exist for camps and open up the possibility for other, to explore at least, other long-term possibilities. Can I, um, can I ask very crudely then, should we, um, I mean, this is a very crude framing of this question, but you know, are you suggesting that we tell donors that um, happy urban refugees will migrate to your countries. Um, and if you keep them in camps, that um, they, you know, not only do they suffer, but the rates of migration will be higher. Because one of the things that drives the encampment of refugees is also this highly racialized migration policy. That the donor countries have, which is that they don't want they they don't want people from certain parts of the world coming to them, um, and this framing of crisis then moves money in certain directions to keep people away from their shores, right? So keeps them in camps and and, and so forth. 
Um, so that's what I like. I mean, I'm, 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 I, 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 I think I've said this before, and, and I will repeat this again. And I agree with with this younger as well. I think that that you know, I think this. This idea of having a freedom-based approach to migration is absolutely what we need. Um, and camps are absolutely not the solution. Um, and you know, we and, and the idea that you know we can we can turn this around and we can say that this is an opportunity for cities to renew themselves. And you know, again, there's a really nice point that that is kind of made, which is that they shouldn't be seen as burdens because they're not. It's not a very humane way to view um, anybody nobody should be should be labeled in that way but we do have these kinds of racialized migration policies in place so coming back to this kind of a pragmatic question then is that the messaging that we then get across to the donors uh, can i can i can i just um, add so I, yeah, I, I, again, you know, we we have to be very practical. You know, uh, I'm going to share my my own experience. You know, I was a refugee uh, when I was 17 years old, and 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 uh, was in after living in a camp for a couple of months. I got a job, you know, uh, and I got a job, and I became self sufficient. Yeah. Uh, of course, you know, whatever restriction at that time in terms of curfew and as I have to apply. But the idea that, you know, that UNSCR is no longer is controlling my life uh, is, is as soon as I got a job, you know, I have I have my own earning. Yeah. And, and so rather than being, you know, as we uh, recipients of the handouts uh, or a burden quote-unquote of UNHCR or the uh, the, the donor, uh, donor agencies, I get my freedom. At least if I'm a human, human being, I can work, I can support families, I can raise children. That idea has to be enshrined in whatever policy we can. Freedom is key, you know. And, and, but if we keep saying it's a prison, well, prison doesn't have rights, you know. You know, prisoners cannot just leave the camp. They have to stay there. Uh, they can't open business, you know, because they're, you know, business for whom, you know. Um, so the idea should be always, you know, do people have, you know, God-given rights, you know, th that freedom, you know. Yeah, you know, I, 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 people don't choose to become refugees, for the sake of you know, it's not it's not you know some kind of tourism, <laughs> yeah. So whether in 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 Ethiopia, I mean, the, you know, the Somalis in Kenya are hardworking. Uh, they open business, you know, uh, you know, Somalis wherever they go, whether in in in, in Kenya, whether was there in Minnesota, are very successful because they have the right to work. They have the right to make a decision. Uh, self-determination. If they want to go to school for 20 years, they have the right to. So the idea that a camp, which nobody even discussed it, and in, in after when in 1951 discussion, nothing, no, not not even in the document that says refugees should be a warehouse for generation. I mean, imagine yourself or your family being in a refugee camp for 50 years or 40 years. Yeah. When I was in Dadaab, I met uh, this uh, w uh, this young man. You know, he, he was born in in Somalia, but, but he left when he was eleven. So at Dadaab, he grew up there. He got married with someone who was actually born in a refugee camp. So he has three children. All of them are had never been. Yeah, but they are just sitting there. Yeah. So I think, I think that the solution is it. You know. Refugee issues has to become a humanitarian issue, you know. I mean, and, and the other idea, you know, you know, what we are, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say this, please forgive me, but we have this selective humanity, yeah, you know. Selective humanity is no humanity at all. Some people are human, we care about them, we react quickly. For some, we just don't think that they exist, yeah. And, and and that is a practice I think we need to fight. Uh, and I think the solution is whether it is a housing issue, whether education issue, 
should be based on freedom, you know, God-given freedom of every human being. Can you imagine all of us? I mean, at least I was a refugee. I'm not sure about it. Can you imagine being a refugee camp for 20 years, 30 years of yourself and raising family? Uh, you know, I, I think I think that's what the debate needs to be. Uh, and and uh, look, you know, I, I met refugees when I went to Kenya about five, six months ago. Some of them are not registered by anybody. Nobody knows them. They're afraid. Sorry. Thank you. You're getting a lot of you're getting support in the chat, mm -hmm. in the, uh, particularly on the question of selective humanity is no humanity at all. A very powerful message. Um, I did want to not let Lauren off the hook though and make him answer Romna's question. <laughs> I was a little happy with helping this debate while I don't have to ask the questions. Yeah. No, thanks. I mean, I think that, well, just to build on, on what Iskander has just said, I mean, I, I also would share the idea of a, of a kind of universal humanity and, and one in which people have the maximum amount of choice as to where they want to go. But I think we also have to recognize that we are in a deeply unequal, deeply racialized world in which there are power dynamics. And, and we, to get to that broader humanity, we have to think through how do we dismantle those broader structures. We can't just wish them away as much as, as we'd like to. And, and, and in this way, I think there's, there's a, you know, to your point, Ramola, like how do we talk to donors about this? Because they are afraid of the black and brown invasion, let's be blunt. I mean, they don't mind the Ukrainians, they don't want the Afghans, they don't want the Africans, right? So what do we do about this? And, and they think keeping them in camps is the way to keep them out of, of Europe. And to the extent that keeping people poor is a very effective way of keeping them from migrating, that works, right? But what they haven't seen, and I think somehow, is that camps all around the world are also the sites of radicalism, right? You put people without hope in a place, just in the same way that ghettos or elsewhere, where people live without hope, become a site of radical, sometimes liberatory, but often quite millenarian movements. And that's what we've seen, for example, coming out of northern Kenya, right? It's Al-Shabaab is part of what's grown out of those camps, where there's generations of people who have not seen another way to make a difference. And that is perhaps more dangerous to Europe, to the United States, than, you know, a few thousand migrants who might make it there. And I think, you know, those kind of discussions perhaps can help shift the incentives more than do it for them, because very clearly they don't care. Thank you. I think we can now turn to some of the questions. I think we can open up questions in the room. There's also some questions in the chat that we'll come to in a moment, but I thought I'd see if anyone in the room would like to pose a question to one of our speakers. Or disagree. Or disagree. Yeah. No one brave enough? Ah, there we are. Please um, let us know who you are, and you may need the roving mic. So hang on one second. Thank you, President Roth well from NSA. Um, I, I wanted to ask a question, maybe this is also for you, about the framing of the question. It says, how can we achieve the world without the long term refugee camps? And I guess I wondered if there's an assumption in there that in the short term they are a solution. So I just wanted to kind of, in terms of how you frame that question and why the long term was in there rather than at no camps at all. Well, I, did, I mentioned that at the start. Um, when I, I was saying that there are obviously times when you have large numbers of people crossing a border where temporary solutions are needed to protect people from the, from the elements. This point was more thinking about the long term when we've gone past the emergency phase and we get, move into the care and maintenance and the warehousing, the point at which it can no longer be described as, as an acute crisis. And that it's clear that that the humani that, this, that, that the humanitarians should have taken a step aside, but they but they don't or they can't. So that was that's why we're talking about the that's why I put the long term in to avoid people saying, well, what would you do if you know hundred thousand people yeah. suddenly cross one border? And, you know, <laughs> so that was, that's why it's there. It's a kind of caveat. <laughs> Just can I can I can I add something? Oh. You know, I think in you know one thing we learned 
because of the Ukraine crisis, you know. So when thousands of Ukrainians decided to come to the EU countries, uh, we didn't put them in the refugee camp. We just say, oh, come, you know, we have three years, you have a right to go to school, you have to work, no problem. Yeah. So, so somehow we, we recognize that, you know, these are not just 20,000 people, it's massive, you know, Poland and other countries, Germany. I mean, all of a sudden, you know, they became immediately accepted, you know, they got their freedom, you know, to bring the kids, you know, and go to school without any requirement. I mean, for me, I think it, that was the most wonderful thing that we have seen in the last 70 years. So the idea of embracing this newcomers, this stranger, um, you know, just to society and people are opening doors and uh, there is no legal b- barrier, they, they can drive. And then when I go to the job, I say, oh, no, these are unwanted, you know, perhaps less human. <laughs> uh, or when they come from the from Libya, going to Italy or, or, or Britain or France, I mean, for heaven's sake, we used to have a camp in, in, in Paris uh, for African refugees. It's called the jungle, actually. <laughs> I mean, imagine that selectivity, you know, and, and that selectivity is what bothers me a lot, you know. It is there, when we saw that that camp in Paris for, you know, African refugees, we we were quiet, yeah. And we're still quiet when, you know, Britain and others decided, oh, send them to Uganda or some to Rwanda, or we are not accepting them. So th- this idea is we have to sort out these things be- before we come to a, a permanent solution in uh, what UNSC or another called du- durable solution. So again, you know, that practice is, 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 yes, you know, I mean, here, you know, I'm in mean, the United States, you know, within two weeks, you know, we give temporary protected status for, for Ukrainian, which is a wonderful thing that we did. But for others, they waited for years. And why are we taking the, the Ukrainian to the U.S.? At the same time, we're just deporting Haitians also. So you see that this, and and, and then, you know, again, the, the silence is, is what's really uh, uh, difficult. Uh, and, and, you know, when that happened, you know, there was no outrage. Uh, but even my own agency, we were very happy that Ukrainian got two weeks uh, TPS status. How wonderful it is! You know, the the Afghan are coming in. You know, God, God bless America. They're they're coming, which is wonderful. I mean, I'm, I'm as, you know, as you know that we have resettled over three million refugees, but we chose and we selected who comes. You know, but if you are coming from Honduras, Guatemala, uh, or El Salvador. A completely different process, yeah. So I, again, the selectivity, the, this this advocacy of selective outrage. Uh, some refugee pain is more painful than the other one. Is more, you know, uh, easy uh, or yeah, expected. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. So those of you in the room can't see the chat. But in the chat, we've got some support for refugee camps and a request to acknowledge uh, some of the positive aspects of being in a camp. So I'm going to um, read some of these out so you can see how you feel about about, about these points being made. So uh, one example here, what would you say to the refugee stories, success stories, to veteran refugees in India come to mind and the role of refugee organization and agency in creating successful communities? Um, although recognizing that uh, they face issues of citizenship and deprivation. Um, interestingly, a lot of this speaks to the context in which Romola has been working, so she may have to answer all of these questions. Um, thank you for the presentations. Um, uh, a question here about uh, community support and grassroots cooperation inside Palestinian refugee camps um, and how we can work on the problem without losing the social value of community which is unique to the camp. A uh, question, 
also a point about how uh, camps can increase housing stock, um, uh, which can be a benefit for refugees and hosts. Um, uh, and I'm going to stop there. So this uh, camp as uh, the social, I guess, the sort of social world that evolves inside a camp and the, and the positives of that that we've seen actually in our own research. Um, the idea of camps is increasing housing stock um, and the sort of specific question around success stories of Tibetan refugees in India, which I'm not familiar with. So I'm going to hand this over to people who might know more about those issues. Okay, um, oh, I'll, I'll start with the Tibetan question first. Um, I, I probably to preface this for those who are not familiar with the Indian context, India is it does is not a signatory to the Refugee Convention and does not have a national refugee law. So um, as a result, the country also exercises very different attitudes towards different groups of refugees. And there are a lot of refugees in India, lots of different refugee groups in India. There are Afghans, there are Tibetans, there are Chin, um, there are Rohingya, um, there are stateless uh, people from Pakistan, there are various uh, groups of people who have come to India in search of refuge and, and scholars in India will often talk about India. Um, and I was thinking of India as a country when I said countries don't will say that we're not a country of asylum, but at the same time they say, oh, we don't refuge people. Um, this is one of those countries where simultaneously they do not have a national refugee law, but also they do, they also don't refuge people in theory. Uh, we can get into that later. I think the Tibetan question is a bit is complex. I think for several reasons. One is that um, Tibetans um, are given certain privileges in India in comparison to other refugee communities in the country. Um, they're treated differently to other refugees in the country, and there are many NGOs that have made this point as well. Um, and there are geopolitical issues at stake, particularly the ongoing geopolitical conflicts between India and China. Um, Tibet plays a significant, the Tibetan question plays a significant role in it. Um, that's just the Tibetan refugee question. I also want to um, we you know, turn the, the, the spotlight in a slightly different direction because I think that people have a tendency to look at Tibetans you know, as a successful community, as a, as a community that's done really well, without realizing the hardships that the Tibetan community has gone through as well. Um, they, having had the privilege, and I will highlight the point of privilege of working with, um, starting to work with the Tibetan community in India, um, they, they, they simultaneously are given a lot of support from different local uh, governments and, and state governments, but at the same time, they also face a lot of difficulties, um, negotiating a lot of different things. They also face racism in the country. Um, again, these are not kinds of questions that, that often come up in relation to some of these places, but, um, but they also face a lot of different kinds of issues within India, which I don't think are adequately discussed. Um, so I think we need to be a little bit careful when we talk about the success of um, Tibetan communities because that success comes in very particular ways because of, of geopolitical calculations. You can, you can look at other communities in India who are also refugees in the country and you can ask, well, why have they not benefited in the same kinds of ways? Um, to sort of uh, put that in, in the contrast. Um, Again, the, the, um, the Palestinian camp question, I think, you're, I think the, the question is, is a really good uh, question in that, um, that you do have, you know, that, the, the, that there's a social value to the community that, is, that exists over there. But I, I, I feel like, I, I kind of wonder, like, is it presuming that that's, that social value wouldn't exist if the camp wasn't there? Do we need to have a camp in order to have a community? I think that's the question that I would ask. So this, um, the sound is back. So there's a question about the housing stock, and it's based on, um, uh, as far as I'm aware, some research um, in Jordan, specifically looking at how uh, the construction of the Zatari camp has eased um, the 
the cost of rent in Amarna, that if the camp hadn't been built, there'd be more pressure on the city and rents would be even more perhaps unaffordable than they are already. But I, um, I appreciate the point that um, someone in the room has just made that um, why would why would we have spent that money on on that extremely expensive camp? What could we have done with those resources if we put them into a city? If we thought about using urban planning approaches, whereby you might look at where city planners were thinking the city might expand in future, you could have put um, some housing there instead, rather than choosing to put a camp in the desert <laughs> at great expense. And as I said before, actually at incalculable expense. So in a different research project, we've been looking into just trying to find out what has been spent on wash in Zachary Camp, just one sector on water sanitation. And it is not possible to find that out. It seems that nobody knows. And we've been spending months, even years actually, digging, trying to, with available data that's in the public domain, including on the transparency uh, initiative, the IAT transparency around aid. Uh, yes, I'm, you catch a note of cynicism. I think but um, we don't even know what's being spent on, on camps. And so this question about what could you do with the money if you invested it somewhere else, um, it becomes impossible to answer. And I think that's one area where I think we need to take forward new research and, and new advocacy. Um, so that we, rather than sort of thinking about camps as, as um, reducing rents in cities, we think about spending that money more wisely, more sustainably. Um, uh, do we have a question in the room? Yes, Alison. Um, I might have to repeat it to make sure that the, the online people can hear, but have a go, and if you if people online, if you can't hear Alison Brown, please let Alison, me know. Sorry, Alison Brown, Cardiff University. I wonder if you could talk about concentration rather versus dispersal. Uh, one of the issues about camps is that they are concentrated, and in fact, it might be easier to absorb populations, new incoming populations, in protracted displacement if they're dispersed. Of course, if they're dispersed, then they lose the benefits of social support, but that might actually make the absorption of new um, populations are likely to become in protracted displacement easier within some context, not when it's a small community with a large number of people moving in, but in some context that dispersal might be a, a way forward because I do not see that we can renegotiate the 1951 convention at the moment with geopolitics as it is. So we've probably got to think about pragmatic approaches. Responses? Well, I would just, I mean, I think you're right. But I think like many good sense options with humanitarianism, the practical is not the pragmatic. That's what makes sense. But it doesn't help navigate the politics of it, which is to keep people from dispersing. We don't want competition in the labor market, as you hear. We don't want competition in housing. And we don't want these people culturally infecting our body populace, right? So the, the political incentive is often to concentrate even though the humanitarian and the practical one, obviously, is to let people choose and actually to facilitate them choosing where they want to go. But that's something we've known for a long time, right? And that's something that we saw, you know, with Ikara too, where this whole zone of the country, where Liberians coming into Cote d'Ivoire, for example, they can settle anywhere, let them go, we'll provide support wherever they end up. But politically, that just couldn't last, right? It just didn't work. Um, and so, that's, I think, is the challenge, is, is saying, what are the politics of this, right? It's not just what is good for the refugees, it's what is good within the calculus, the political calculus of the place where the refugees go. I just wanted to also quickly respond to the comment about the cultural, social values. And I think there's, there has to be a distinction made. I mean, we can, we can look at, for example, hip hop and say we love it without saying, we endorse racism or ghettoization of black and segregation, right? Which comes out of that history. So the fact that there is solidarity is something we can celebrate. But we can also, I think as Romulo was saying, solidarity might have emerged in different forms. And solidarity that is emerges to fight a battle against injustice, maybe the real choice, the real better option is to try to address that injustice, right? And, and in the case, 
so many solidarities in camps, it comes about and they can be quite destructive. Not, not all solidarity is social capital can be quite negative, right? Rather than say, well, we need to protect that and use that as an excuse for preserving, to say, what are they, why, where, what gave birth to that? And if that is unjust in its beginning, whatever else comes from it cannot be really celebrated. I wonder if that's not the best moment to end, actually, with Lauren's wise words. And to thank everybody, including my wonderful speakers, our wonderful speakers. Thank you, Skinda, Romola, Lauren. Apologies for the problems with the connection. Um, we have been in this room for two days without issue. I'm sorry that something happened. I think maybe the whole of the UK went home and put their kettles on or something. <laughs> Even a cup of tea and, and the internet crashed. <laughs> Sorry about that, but I think there is going to be a recording, um, and I think we should probably uh, think about blogging about these issues as well, um, and carrying on the conversation online and in person where we can. Thank you for the people in the room, it's wonderful to, have to see you here, thank you for everyone online. Um, and uh, yeah, tune in to another IID debate soon. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thanks, thanks, thanks. Thank you.